Hi, folks. If you are just joining us, um, it, we had an icebreaker, but it looks like the chat is. Um, hey, I was able to open the chat, so everyone should be able oh, to. Oh, you can. It. Oh, yay. I, I love that you're good at computer because I'm clearly not. If anyone has met me, you'll know I'm not good at computer things. Uh, but hooray. So, okay. If the chat is working now, I would love for everyone to introduce themselves in the chat. Um, attendees, everyone, just say your name, your pronouns, where you're calling in from. And our icebreaker is um, when you feel like it's spring. For me today, it feels like a nice spring day. But when you think it's spring, what's the first spring activity that you want to do? So please introduce yourselves in the chat. And um, we will be, we'll take questions from the Q&A section. Um, if you see at the bottom, there's a little Q&A chat feature. And uh, we'll also let you raise your hand and then we'll call on you that way too. We'll probably do raised hands first, but if you think of a question while someone is talking, throw it in the Q&A and we'll come back to it. And um, I'll also follow up with folks afterwards on some links and things that come up in the presentation. So if you have a question that doesn't get answered, I'll try to um, answer that for you in the in the week coming up if um, if we aren't able to. And I see some of our panelists are here. G is here, chiming, yay, hooray. Okay, so please continue to introduce yourselves in the chat and I am going to hand it over to Charming to formally welcome us. I'm gonna make her, Molly, if you know how to spot hey, Katie. Hi. <laughs> no, uh, I had a little pro internet issue this morning, so I needed to reboot. And um, you know, that takes a little while. So, oh, oh, and my video, I am here. Hi everyone, I am Charming Evelyn and um, I am the chair of uh, the Water Committee for Sierra Club, Angeles Chapter and for Sierra Club California, uh, co-chair with, along with Bill Martin. And so today um, as an opening, I really just wanted to give everyone just a brief introduction to the Water Committee as a whole and what we do and also um, Sierra Club, really and truly, because it is something that people, a lot of people find really complicated. Um, and so we'll just do a brief, a really quick overview today. And the slides will be available for you folks. Um, Katie will share them with you and um, later. So I will just be going through really quickly. And of course, Let's see, my slideshow started on the last slide. Why? I have no idea. More internet issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go back then. And if the internet continues to be slow, folks, I will turn off my camera. Yeah, okay, do that. Just... Yeah, talk if you need to. Yeah, maybe I'll do that right now because it's causing an it's causing an issue. It's got thirsty or hungry. Thanks, Lord. Really uh, I saw that. Love you. Good luck. Okay, I think we're I think we should be good now. So welcome everyone um, and welcome to this Delta webinar. And um, a little Sierra Club history, we were founded in 1892 by John Muir. Sierra Club is the largest and most influential grassroots um, environmental organization in the country with 3.5 million members and supporters. Sierra Club California alone actually has about half a million of those. Sierra Club helped establish and expand national parks like Yosemite and Grand Canyon, and we pushed to define landmark legislation like the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. So Sierra Club actually is international. There's a Sierra Club Canada, and there are 63 chapters nationwide. Um, and of course, the first chapter to be established was called the Southern California section, 
which was Ely and Orange County. And at the time, Orange County was actually a part of Ely County. We focus on three different things, political, conservation, and outings. And you can usually find each of these things within a chapter. Sierra Club California. Sierra Club California is our legislative and advocacy branch that lobbies state legislature, the administration, state government agencies to protect California's natural resources and improve the health and safety of all Californians. And so, of course, our political advocacy, that's what makes us a 501c4 um, organization. Each chapter has its own political committee. They review, interview, vet, and endorse candidates for local office within their geographical jurisdiction. Of course, the role of Sierra Club California uh, in, this, in district advocacy, we look at legislation, priority bills, speak to the governor, state agencies, have candidate approval forms, local measure, um, local ballot measure approval forms, and statewide ballot measure approvals as well. So we look at all of these things. And just, you know, you may not have noticed it, but when someone is actually endorsed by Sierra Club, the logo is different. They cannot use our traditional green logo. Their logo is black and white. Okay, so conservation advocacy. When we talk about conservation, what are we talking about? So the California Conservation Committee is chartered and originally known as CNRCC or California Nevada Regional Conservation Committee. It establishes general conservation policy and specific conservation positions for the 13 California Sierra Club chapters and Sierra Club California. Having one California policy maintains consistency between chapters and provides direction for Sierra Club California advocacy staff and the California Legislative Committee. Chapters, of course, then can take positions within their own geographical boundaries. And the Sierra Club Board of Directors, they establish conservation policy for all of Sierra Club. Outings and advocacy, each chapter has its own outings um, and you can register for you to be an outings leader. You have to be trained. They do offer uh, first, aid uh, first aid training and certification, the wilderness training course and the leadership training course. And let's talk about water. So, you know, uh, California's constitutional mandate states that water must be put to beneficial use to the maximum extent and waste or unreasonable use should be prevented. And so this is the mandate that we work under as the water committee, whether it's on the local level or whether it's within Sierra Club California. Um, this is actually just our water conservation resolution for the Angeles chapter, and you could read that on your own, but basically we advocate for permanent water conservation, which of course, when we do that, that helps preserve the Delta, the Colorado River, and Mono Lake. Uh, we can skip that, you can read that on your own. And so these are some of the things we work on. Less reliance and protect the Delta, less reliance and protect Mono Lake, less reliance, protect the Colorado River, promote reliance and sustainability with the local projects, uh, support legislation for direct portable reuse, protect fisheries, wildlife of the Delta, support tribes, monitor water agencies, review water legislation, um, flood risk planning, and try to partner with the political committee on water board endorsements. And we're asking you to get involved. Get involved today. Be, be part of that action. Get involved with Katie's uh, volunteer group. Uh, get involved when the petitions come around because these things are so important. We are a grassroots organization which is run bottoms up, not top down. Volunteers do the work. Staff facilitate the work volunteers do. Volunteers set policy interview and help hire staff and decide which campaigns we work on. And you know, we get to have fun when we're doing while we're doing these things. And so I just encourage everyone really to get involved. 
And, you know, our major areas of concern, again, op opposing the Delta Conveyance Project, Cadiz Mining Project, ocean desalination, promoting water quality, water recycling, water independence, affordability and sustainability, protecting the LA River, the coast, local waterways, and educating through presentation white and white papers. And... Um, this, you know, you're going to learn this a lot of a lot about the Delta today, but the other places we get water is from uh, local groundwater, Eastern Sierras via the LA Aqueduct, of course, the San Joaquin Sacramento Delta, California Aqueduct, sometimes referred to as the State Water Project, and the Colorado River via the Colorado River Aqueduct. And I will let Katie and everyone else on the panel today educate you about the Bay Delta. That's what today is about. Um, and you can read also about Mono Lake and how we are working to preserve Mono Lake as well. And of course, the Colorado River, which has been in the news quite a bit. Um, ocean desalination, I get that question a lot. It is the last resort after conservation, water reuse, storm water capture have all been exhausted. And we have a very comprehensive desalination policy. And so, um, you know, with that, again, I encourage you to get involved. Please do outreach. Please do tabling. Um, you know, if if you can get to it, always make sure that you speak out on behalf of water, amplify the messaging coming from the tribes, and advocate for water conservation all the time and everywhere you can. And with that, I will turn it over to Katie. And again, you can see the you can read the slides on your own and see the rest of your slides. Thank you, Katie. Thanks for having me here today. Thank you. Thanks, Charming. Um, if you could, okay, good. You stopped sharing. And now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Molly, can you make me the spotlight? Is that working? Let me see. I think that worked. Okay, yeah. Um, someone just gave me a thumbs up chiming. Am I the am I the big screen now? Great. Okay. Awesome. Then I will. Okay, here we go. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that charming. That was a fantastic overview of almost everything that we do at Sierra Club, um, at least in terms of water, but you know, so many other topics. And today I'd like to talk about just some updates on water projects in the Delta. A lot has happened in even the last two months. And um, I'd love to just tell you what's going on. And I'm the water campaign manager for Sierra Club California. So first of all, the Bay Delta, most of you live there, you you know quite a bit already, but just um, some updates on some challenges. The Bay Delta is facing a number of ecological problems like flooding, saltwater intrusion, rising temperatures, poor air and water quality, harmful algal blooms, and harm to wildlife. And they're due to a variety of reasons, but the what I always tell people, if you could sum it up in one sentence, the nutshell is that it's the reduction in freshwater flows that's it, if not the biggest cause of most of these problems. A recent study said that we are now facing Anthropocene extinction, which is a rapid erotic eradication of species caused by human activity. No animal group is more at risk than fish. In 2023, for only the third time in history, the California salmon fishing season was closed. Researchers recently concluded that our state is a world leader in the number of freshwater fishes likely to become extinct by the end of the century. This fall, Baykeeper and Allies petitioned to have longfin smelt listed as federally endangered and white sturgeon as threatened under the Endang Endangered Species Act, and they're suing to get a final decision. California relies too heavily on imported water from imperiled ecosystems like the Bay Delta, Mono Lake, and Colorado River. What we really need is more local reliance and sustainability through conservation and efficiency efforts. So let me give you some updates on a timeline of the Delta Tunnel. The Delta Conveyance Project, or the Delta Tunnel, is Governor Newsom and DWR, that's the Department of Water Resources, it's their proposal to build a 45-mile long tunnel that would divert up to 6,000 cubic feet per second of freshwater flows from the Sacramento River and deliver the water to water agencies south of the Delta. 
DWR released the final environmental impact report for the tunnel on December 8th, and then they certified the document 10 days later without taking any comments. They put out an updated timeline on January 8th, and we can now expect a cost estimate on the tunnel this spring, a cost-benefit analysis this summer, and a vote to fund the planning and permitting for 2025 through 2027, later this year or possibly next year. The vote to fund the construction is expected to be in 2027, but hopefully our challenges to the permits will push that out if that day even comes at all. There's a rumor that DWR will petition the State Water Board for water rights this upcoming week. Metropolitan Water District, or MET, is the tunnel's biggest state water contractor, participating at 47.2%, or currently estimated around $11 billion, with MET looking at a $4 billion water recycling project, plus regular maintenance, possible desalination projects, and decreasing revenue. It seems more unlikely that they can afford the tunnel, especially considering inflation since their last cost estimate. We can actively promote other options like the freshwater pathways, underground water storage south of the Delta, and increase conservation and efficiency projects as alternatives to the tunnel that would benefit not just MET, but the Delta and other state water contractors. MET and many other water agencies make their money by selling water, which we desperately need to conserve. They are reevaluating their business model and have asked us and other allies for help in that, and we've even begun working our ideas into their model. We're in talks with them about a pilot project for capturing dewatered water from construction projects. We're working on suggestions for their financial model and are open to any ideas. We're also seeking volunteers to come, with our, come up with our own cost-benefit analysis ahead of theirs. On January 16th of this year, the Sacramento County Superior Court denied DWR's request for an order validating bond resolutions that would have financed the tunnel. The court held that DWR exceeded its authority under Section 11260 of the Water, Co uh, of the Water Code when it adopted bond resolutions in August of 2020 to authorize the issuance of bonds to pay for the construction of the project. We're expecting an appeal and need to see the impact of the state budget deficit and local laws, but this may prove really beneficial if the debt limit makes it too difficult for the state water contractors to afford the tunnel. January 19th, Sierra Club filed a lawsuit against the tunnel, joined with our allies there, and the complaint alleges that the final EIR for the Delta Tunnel is deficient. Sites Reservoirs, the proposed construction and operation of 1.5 million acre feet uh, capacity of off-stream water storage facility uh, located about 80 miles north of Sacramento in the Antelope Valley of Calusa County. Uh, site's final EIR was released and approved in November following the certification of the FEIR, uh, sorry, final environmental impact report. A number of organizations filed lawsuits challenging the CEQA document. Around the same time, Governor Newsom certified the project for streamlined judicial review of the CEQA process using authority under a new law passed last summer SB 149, which was intended to streamline permitting for certain environmentally beneficial projects. A number of environmental organizations, including Sierra Club California, appealed to the legislature to override the governor's certification, but the legislature chose not to take action. Last year, Sierra Club California and many other organizations filed protests to the site's authority's application for a water right. Sites will need the board to approve their water right application in order to divert water into the reservoir. The next step in the process is for the board to try to resolve the protest by conducting a hearing prior to determining whether to ultimately issue the permit. In 2018, the board finally moved forward with adopting updated standards for the Lower San Joaquin River, its tributaries, the Tuolumne, Stanislaus, and Merced Rivers, and Southern Delta Salinity, and that was part of phase one of the Bay Delta Plan. The adopted plan would require 40% of the unimpaired flow to remain in rivers between February and June. However, five years later, the board has still not, um, more than five years later, has still not implemented phase one of the Bay Delta plan. The board is currently moving forward with phase two of the update. The staff report evaluates proposed alternatives for updated standards for the Sacramento River and Delta outflows. The draft staff report on the Bay Delta plan phase two update was not able to include comprehensive information on proposed implementation and enforcement of the VA framework because the VA parties have yet to finalize them. The state proposed 55% unimpaired flows with an adaptive range between 45% and 65%. Sierra Club is calling for 65% or more unimpaired flows using the best available science and the inclusion of tribal beneficial uses in the plan. 
On January 19th, the US EPA Region 9 urged the State Water Board to update, adopt, and implement a, del a Bay Delta plan that incorporates tribal beneficial uses and numeric flow objectives supported by the best, best available science. Significantly, the EPA raised concerns with the VA proposal and requested additional information to demonstrate a scientific basis for the claimed benefits. Additionally, the EPA recommends the board to incorporate new scientific studies published after 2017. The State Water Board did not adequately engage or consult with tribes in planning, which is part of the required government-to-government -government consultation. The Delta Tribal Environmental Coalition's civil rights complaint and petition for rulemaking is ongoing, but you'll hear more about that from Crystal and Cynthia about this later. Comment period for Phase 2 ended in January. Now the board will review all comments submitted before moving forward with one of the alternatives, adopting an updated Bay Delta plan and developing an implementation plan for Phase 2. The voluntary agreements are a proposal between water agencies, the state, federal agencies as an alternative to the board's regulatory update of the Bay Delta Plan. In comparison to the Bay Delta Plan, which proposes to designate in-stream flows to support water quality, the VA has proposed a combined approach between voluntary flow contributions and habitat restoration. Several habitat restoration projects that would be counted towards the VAs are well underway and would continue regardless of whether a VA is adopted. Moreover, the VAs are not backed by the best available science. The science shows that flow, not habitat, is the master variable in the delta. The VAs do not provide sufficient flows to provide meaningful benefits for native fish and water quality. The EPA, with, along with the Delta Tribal Environmental Coalition, is concerned that the staff report does not provide sufficient evidence to demonstrate that the proposed VA assets will protect beneficial uses in the Sacramento River and Delta watersheds. Okay, there are a couple things we could use help with. If you are a finance whiz, please reach out to me and join our other volunteers working on the financial modeling for MET. If you have other specific ideas about a tool or a project in a specific area that should be incorporated, like maybe you know a particular farmer who would be happy to um, use their land for spreading grounds, uh, maybe they're in a really ideal place for um, spreading grounds and um, stormwater capture. That's something we would love to know and help work that into the plan. Um, we can also use a finance or economics expert for the cost benefit analysis on the, on the tunnel. We'd like to do our own version to compare when the state comes out with theirs. We're seeking a volunteer lawyer for help on another case involving the state water project in CEQA. It's a little complicated to explain here, but I'm happy to chat with someone. And with roughly three years to go until that big construction vote, and you know, ideally it's more than three years, but uh, we're, we're in a movement building phase right now, trying to educate the public, especially in Southern California about the issues. So we're looking for volunteers to help with class visits, talking to clubs, other groups about all of these issues. If you're directly impacted by any of these Delta projects, so maybe you live in the Delta, you're a member of a tribe, you live in an area, they would pay a lot more money for these um, in both water rates and higher taxes for these projects. We would love to interview you, get a video and uh, use this to share and pass along the information. We also need help collecting data from some of these agencies from their website. So if, uh, if you're not really someone who wants to talk on film and you don't like talking to people, you're maybe more of an introvert, this would be perfect for you. Uh, but if you do like people, if you like talking to people and fresh air, we're also going to be canvassing soon. So that would be really helpful. So if you want to talk more about any of these special projects, please email me. I'll put my email in the chat and I'll send it to you and you probably already have it. But we can talk more about that. And then during the break, I'm going to put up a QR code um, where you can stay on top of all these urgent actions and votes. And we'll tell you when these big things are happening. And then we're also looking for folks to send letters to the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission about their design drought and their high utility rates, which we can talk about a bit more there. So uh, we took a little more time than I wanted, but uh, we got four minutes. I think we could take one or two questions. Um, I'm gonna check the Q&A, but if anyone wants to raise their hand. Um, Steve Hayes wants to know if we are directly involved with North Delta Cares. Um, I'm based in LA. I mostly work with Metropolitan, so I I don't work with North Delta Cares. Um, but I can um, 
I can see if anyone else at Sierra Club is. We do have a lot of chapters, a lot of different, we have multiple water committees working on some of these issues and um, different staff. So I can find out if anyone else is. Any other questions, comments? I believe you are able to raise your hand if you do have a question or a comment. And I'll go through the chat as well. Deirdre says that she worked with North Delta Cares extensively in the Delta planning, Delta plan consistency hearing. And Delta, um, sorry. Delta. Deirdre will be um, talking more about some of these issues later. And we do have a, nope, someone lowered their hand. Okay. Um, with that said, if we saved a few minutes, then Crystal, are you um, ready to go and start talking? I, um, if, yeah, I see you came off mute. Oh, there you go. So yes, let me introduce Miss Crystal Moreno. Crystal is the traditional ecological knowledge pro um, she manages the traditional ecological knowledge program for the shingle springs rancheria band of miwok indians she uses tek involving the the evolving knowledge acquired by indigenous peoples over hundreds or thousands of years through direct contact with the environment to educate policymakers on california water projects thank you crystal let me just um make you the spotlight and there we go Thanks so much. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I guess it's afternoon. Thank you, um, Katie and Charming, for having me today. Uh, the vice chair, Melissa Tayaba, was unable to join. And so I'm here speaking on behalf of the vice chair as well as uh, Shingle Springs um, tribal leadership. So I'll give you a little bit of background about um, how the tribe you know, was actually able to get to the table on water issues in general. And, uh, you know, there are so many tribes that just are under capacity, under resource, not able to engage, not able to keep up with, you know, various priorities. And so through the um, generosity of our tribal council, um, we were able to take on this work and really start expanding um, not just our team, but just our ability to get into these issues. Um, I believe it was in 2018, uh, Vice Chair Tayaba, you know, said, we need to get into water issues. How do we do that? And so we start. We actually started at DWR with Anasita Augustinas, um, reached out to her and said, okay, we're ready. We need to engage. These issues are too important. And we didn't see that there were, you know, a lot of um, what we call the, the Delta tribe, uh, Delta tribal engagement at that time um, regionally. We knew that, you know, up North, there were a lot of tribes that were leading efforts on, on water issues, but, um, you know, not a lot of tribes from the Delta region were able to engage. And so uh, through that effort, vice chair was able to um, get onto the uh, the stakeholder engagement committee uh, with the Delta tunnel. I staffed her on that committee. Uh, we sat through, as I'm sure many of you did, sat through grueling meetings um, that basically amounted to, to nothing. And, and what I mean by that is this. There is a state obligation to consult with tribes under AB 52. Um, consultation um, is supposed to be meaningful and meaningful, you know, obviously is, is subjective. This consultation effort with DWR and this entire process, in our opinion, was, was never meaningful. Um, state agencies are supposed to consult with tribes early, often, um, prior to a plan being in place, and that didn't occur. DWR already had their plan. They knew what they wanted their design to be. Um, and so sitting through that stakeholder engagement committee, sitting through multiple consultation meetings with DWR, basically we feel like was a waste of our time. Our feedback was not incorporated. I think the one thing they point to is, well, look, you told us not to put the intake at Freeport, so we moved it to Hood doesn't work because it's all sensitive territory. It's all culturally sensitive, um, which the department is well aware of. So, you know, we like to say it was a check the box exercise. There was no true and meaningful consultation with tribes. 
um, they're still pushing this project forward that is going to be so detrimental to ancestral homelands, to the communities that live there now, and to our traditional cultural resources. Um, you know, we talk about the Delta as a, uh, a living thing, the water as a living thing. Um, when we go back and we gather in ancestral territories, the Delta is, you know, um, one of our primary places. The, the tribe's connection to the Delta is, is extremely deep. And, and, you know, from the beginning of time, these are places that tribal people, indigenous people have lived in, moved within, um, gathered plants, traditional plants, medicinal plants, um, conducted ceremony, culture. And so it's deeply, deeply embedded in tribal identity. So when projects like this are proposed um, and we share our concerns about further diminishing, you know, um, the estuary and further diminishing this, you know, traditional cultural landscape, um, basically, you know, everything is, is falling on deaf ears. They, they just simply don't care. Um, we once thought, well, maybe if we educate, maybe they just don't know. But what we've what we've been shown is that they do know, they do understand. There's just a, a lack of prioritizing tribal issues and tribal concerns. Um, and so, through all of that, through the through that sham of a stakeholder process, um, through the consultation that you know, like I said, was not true or meaningful, we it became very clear that we had to not just for ourselves get up to speed, but we had to create a mechanism or try to create a mechanism where we could um, have a forum for other impacted tribes to come together, to share knowledge, to, to share resources, and just you know really try to um, stand in solidarity against this project. And so through that, we created um, what we called the, um, the Delta Tribal Engagement Coalition. We had about anywhere from you know seven to nine tribes that regularly participated in that coalition. Um, it's still an ongoing coalition, but you know, due to so many other priorities and like I said before, lack of resources, um, you know, we've had a difficult time keeping that going regularly monthly. So we're probably at about every two months, sometimes three months where we're meeting and, and we're just trying to share knowledge with each other and um, advocacy strategies around the tunnel and other water issues and things like that. Um, having said that, that coalition was specifically focused on Delta region tribes. And so let me go back for a minute just on the Delta itself. The statutorily defined Delta is not what we adhere to. The, the legislature created their boundaries for political reasons, um, which, which I won't get into, but I'm sure that you can imagine. Uh, the, the Northern boundary of the Delta sits right before the confluence of the American and Sacramento River. Our indigenous knowledge tells us that the delta is much more vast. The delta, it's it's the the entire you know Bay Delta watershed, really. And so when we talk about the delta, that's what we talk about. It's all of those lands, it's all of those waterways connected you know to the watershed and all of the tribes along those those waterways. And so um, we we told DWR, your outreach to tribes is insufficient. You can't just have you know one meeting in Sacramento. You need to get up north. You need to get down south, um, and you just need to do a better job engaging. Um, they told us no, and then you know through not just from us but from hearing from even other um, organizations, they finally had one meeting up in the Reading area, um, and I believe you know that was that was useful. They were able to hear from a lot of the um, the northern tribes about impacts that you know uh, water diversion and lack of water management has had on their communities and so um it's it's just been problematic for tribes from the beginning that they limit uh who they think is going to be impacted and so even though we talk about tech right traditional ecological knowledge um even with our indigenous knowledge and telling them how what the delta really is uh they really said well we're you know we don't think that tribes up north are impacted we stay within the footprint of the project the physical footprint of the project and those are the tribes that we do outreach to. So we did our best to try to conduct outreach. Um, we're still doing that. We're trying to build a broader coalition of tribes um, and what's actually allowed that to occur. And I guess we can kind of, in a weird way, think um, how poorly the the, <laughs> the different agencies have done with tribal outreach. Um, 
for the way that we now have this broader coalition of tribes. And that's because they, you know, it's it's not just the Delta Tunnel. It's now the Bay Delta plant update. It's now the voluntary agreements. It's all the ways that state agencies have excluded tribes that now have really um, motivated and impassioned tribes to finally say, you know what, we need to all be, you know, standing in solidarity and um, really combating what the state agencies are doing. So, um, so with that, I guess, you know, from our perspective, we just have been left out. And as more tribes get resources, we're able to get to the table. I mean, when you talk about government, we know how they keep communities under thumb, right? It's it's that they they don't give resources to communities. They just don't. They want to be able to control communities, and so they cut off resources. For tribes, um, you know, that's that's just an ongoing battle. And so when those of us that are fortunate to have the resources uh, and get to the table, um, when that happens, we start to see change. And, you know, because of, um, you know, our tribe's ability to prioritize water issues, we've been able to join other coalitions, which Cynthia will talk about later. Um, we've been able to create our own coalitions, um, intertribal coalitions, uh, because we're now seeing a little bit of a shift. So they're starting to listen. But that wouldn't have happened if we weren't able to do things like partner with Stanford Environmental Law Clinic, partner with some of our, you know, other tribes and, you know, other um, NGOs who are fighting these same battles, um, file petitions, file lawsuits. We had to be able to do those things to make people start to listen. And um, I can't tell you how many people in government, outside government have stopped me or Vice Chair Tayaba and have said, thank you. Thank you for doing this because we're finally starting to see the needle shift a little bit. And um, we have a long way to go, you know, no doubt we, you know, are going to continue to fight. You know, I've even heard some tribes say we will make the Delta Tunnel our standing rock. And, um, and I believe that. And I think that, you know, Shingle Springs has tried to the best of our ability to utilize our resources in a way that benefits not just not just Shingle Springs, but all the tribes in the Delta region. Um, we have a lot of work to do. We really appreciate the support that we've been given by Sierra Club, um, by folks like Restore the Delta, you know, other other um, entities that have you know come in and said, we don't see tribes at the table. Where are they? And they've alerted us. And so I guess you know my ask today is that. If any of you are in rooms where discussions are being had on issues that impact tribes, you can't speak for tribes because you're not, you know, you're you're not from a tribe, but you can definitely say, where are the tribes? Have you engaged with the tribes? Um, because we have been historically and systematically locked out of rooms for, you know, for well, since colonization. Um, the other thing that I will say, well, let me make a point about colonization. We, this is something we say to the state agencies, colonization isn't a thing of the past. Racism isn't a thing of the past. We currently live in, in these structures. And so, you know, we can't sit here and think that, um, you know, equity and diversity are in action. Those are words. Those are words until they become action. And so we really focus on pushing the state agencies, not just to recognize that there's an equity issue or a diversity issue, but to show us with their actions, how they are addressing, <clears throat> excuse me, how they are addressing those issues. Um, which brings me to the State Water Board. Um, we started engaging with them through the Bay Delta, um, Bay Delta plan update process. I, I, I recall the first webinar they had, they gave tribes maybe days notice that it was occurring and their job or their, their aim was to basically gaslight tribes about what was actually occurring in the Bay Delta plan, um, the voluntary agreements. And I remember there were four tribes on that first webinar. Um, and so as the state agency was presenting, because they, that's what they do, they talk at us a lot. They don't really talk with us. Um, and I remember the presenter started, you know, talking about how great tribal engagement was and what great plans these were. And, you know, we had to stop him. We had to call him out and say, don't gaslight us. There are only four tribes on this webinar right now. There are 200 plus tribes in the state of California, and you only have four. Don't tell us that your engagement process, your outreach process has been wonderful and successful 
because as evidenced by the fact that you only have four tribes on this call, it's inadequate. Um, and, you know, so sometimes we have to start those conversations with agencies in that way, because we just, we just will not be talked at anymore. We won't be gaslit anymore. We just have to become, you know, stronger advocates. And so, um, we, you know, at Shingle Springs have, have the, we have the ability to, to be strong advocates. We don't operate out of fear. You know, we, we come from truth. We come from our principles, our tribal values, our goals. Um, and those are that we, you know, are in a position to help protect tribal, um, tribal resources, tribal beneficial uses. And so we're going to do that to the extent possible. Um, with the state board, we, it hasn't been what we want it to be. It hasn't been what it should be. I will say that through, you know, our pushing them, uh, I like to say gently nudging them, um, they are making some changes in tribal engagement. Um, and I think our petition that we filed kind of helps that along. Um, you know, they they in, in cert they are certainly being compelled to do a better job. Um, I can't even tell you how many times I've spoken with their staff and provided best practices on tribal engagement and outreach. And we're just going to continue to do that work because it's necessary. Um, it's something that we're going to have to do for a long time. This Bay Delta plan update, the staff report that just came out, you know, uh, a couple months ago, um, really showed us that even with those discussions, we have a lot of work to do. I can't tell you how many times we talked to them about the importance of including tribal beneficial uses in the Bay Delta plan. Um, we, you know, were, were not surprised, but we were disappointed when the plan, the draft plan came out and there was not a strong uh, recommendation to include tribal beneficial uses in the Bay Delta plan update. So what we're doing now, we're gonna continue our advocacy uh, for inclusion of tribal beneficial uses in the Bay Delta plan update. Um, but because the process has just been so slow, because the process was kicked down to the regional board level and the regional boards have their own you know, methodology, their own way of doing things, there's no uniform approach to um, designating tribal beneficial uses in each region. Uh, we basically said enough is enough, we're gonna run legislation. And so hopefully next week, I'll be able to share with Sierra Club and, and maybe um, Katie, you guys can get this information out to, to your folks. Hopefully next week, a bill will be introduced on tribal beneficial uses, compelling the state to basically, you know, mandate that the state board um, designate and implement tribal beneficial uses statewide, watershed wide. Um, you know, we're, we're just tired of waiting. We're tired of the way that tribes use waterways. We're tired of, of water quality standards, um, you know, not even being developed to address that. And so what happens is because we utilize waterways in different, you know, in different ways than the, the general public, um, potentially tribes are at a greater exposure rate, right, to pollutants, to toxins, to things like, you know, harmful algal blooms, to, um, you know, E. coli. And so we're pushing that legislation. It may be introduced as a spot bill, but we're working really hard to get our language uh, crafted and finalized and dropped into that bill. Um, we're We're excited about it, but we're not unrealistic. And so we know that this is a highly politically charged issue. Um, we know that if tribal beneficial uses are protected, that water quality standards for everyone will improve. Um, and so we know who the players are that are afraid of that. And we also know that the state water board, the regional boards um, are afraid of lawsuits. And I believe that's why it's taken them so long to get tribal beneficial uses designated. I mean, the state water board adopted definitions of tribal beneficial uses in 2017. And just this year, our region, which is region five, um, just adopted definitions. Why does it take so long to adopt definitions that already exist that, you know, the state water board already has on the books? And, um, you know, we firmly believe it's because they just want to drag their feet on this. Uh, they don't want to do the work. They're afraid that they'll be sued by the dischargers and the diverters. Um, 
which again really speaks to how they feel about chives. So they they don't apparently they don't fear us, um, and they don't want to do the work to protect us. And so you know we're going to do what we can to continue to advocate and to look at all of the avenues available to us to make sure that we're doing what we can to protect our own communities. Um, so yes, as soon as that legislation is actually introduced, I will share all that information with with Katie and Charming, and. Um, once I'm done talking, which will be soon here, I will drop my email in the chat. Please feel free to contact me. Um, you know, my my inbox is always inundated, but I eventually do get to emails. Um, and then what was the other thing? Oh, so so Katie, you mentioned about um, DWR's petition for either a change in point of diversion or a new water right that should be coming to the state water board. I was in a meeting yesterday in the Delta. I was able to speak with um, a senior staff member from DWR, and he basically was, you know, very um, forthcoming with information and said, prepare sooner than later. Either it's going to be a petition for a, a point and change of diversion, or it's going to be a petition for a water right. Um, what, we're, what we've been hearing is that the governor is pushing for um, the petition to not be a new water right but to only be a change in point of diversion. Um, we believe that that's motivated, you know, by several factors, one of them being, he believes that's going to make it easier for him to get funding um, to, you know, be able to attach it to the state water project versus, you know, having a, a brand new water right. Um, we're going to fight that. We're going to prepare for that. And so those of you that are able, you know, to, um, to monitor when that petition actually is submitted to uh, the water board. I think right now we need to start preparing for that. It's going to happen soon. Katie, you said you heard maybe next week. We heard definitely February, well, we, not definitely, we heard probably February um, and we're just gonna prepare for that, for that fight. Um, the other component to that, I don't know if some of you saw that in the governor's recently released um, budget proposal, he included $7 billion for the Delta Tunnel and some other, I think maybe volunteer agreements, I can't remember the other um, water projects that that he attached to the $7 billion of funding that he put in this year's budget. Um, we're advocating against that. We did it last budget when he tried to put money in there and, you know, with the help of, you know, so many others, we were able to get that taken out. But um, brand new fight, same, you know, same topic, brand new fight. Um, so we've got the budget process, we've got to, you know, advocate and we've got state water board advocacy going on. We've got Department of Water Resources advocacy going on. And we recently, um, you know, are, have been able to go and, and advocate at the Metropolitan Water District Board. And we will actually be in LA this coming week doing more of that, um, and, you know, and we're hearing it's time. We're hearing that Met's being pressured to have a vote sooner rather than later on on the tunnel. And so we're going to do our very best to make sure that they understand where Shingle Springs is, how we feel about the tunnel, the ways that, you know, Delta tribes will be impacted should it move forward. Um, and we're just trying to do all we can. Um, and again, you know, it's it's so incredibly challenging for other tribes to be able to do all of this work. I, I am just very fortunate that this has become, you know, my main focus. Um, and that's just, again, through the, the wisdom and generation of our tribal council um, and the fact that, you know, we've been able to dedicate resources to, to this fight. So um, I don't know if I'm missing anything I wanted to mention. I think I... I kind of talked a little bit about volunteer agreements. I can say a little bit more about that. Um, that whole entire process was exclusionary. It was intentional. They did not um, engage with one single tribe on voluntary agreements. And this has been going, the, the negotiations for voluntary agreements has been going on five years. Um, you know, once we started talking about that exclusionary process and, you know, how hypocritical it was for the water board to even bring that proposal forward and legitimize it, given their own racial equity resolution, um, we started getting, you know, some response from, um, you know, the, the proponents of the volunteer agreements. And so what did they do um, at, at a board meeting in November? They stuck a little box in their governance structure that said tribes. And at that point had not spoken to any tribes. And so, 
you know, we're playing, they're playing this game. Um, they're now trying to, you know, do webinars, tribal only webinars on the volunteer agreements, and they are stealing our terminology and calling it healthy rivers and landscapes. They're, they're not calling it voluntary agreements anymore. Um, and so a couple of weeks ago, we had this tribal only meeting with, with the um, natural resources agency, Wade Crowfoot got on and talked about how great the agreements were going to be and how they were going to restore rivers and habitat and dub double salmon populations and all these wonderful things um, and completely avoided the science. And so um, through that webinar that they held, we were able to hold a separate tribal caucus on what was really going on. And we were able to have you know, that internal tribal discussion with um, the tribes that were on that webinar who really just didn't know, you know, what was actually occurring. And um, through that, we were able to build out, you know, a coalition, a tribal caucus and um, and get more folks engaged and, and up to speed on these issues and, you know, really just kind of um, assist some of the tribes in, in, you know, understanding what the administration has been doing and and continues to do, which is, you know, they're going to check the box. They're they're holding these meetings and they're going to say, look, we engage with tribes. What do you mean it was exclusionary? Um, and some of us are saying, if you truly want to engage, then you need to go back from the beginning, right? So you've had five years to do this stuff and you're barely bringing us in, you know, now after your, again, after your plans already cooked, right? After your negotiations have already be been done. Now you wanna talk about, oh, but here's your little box on our governance table. Yeah, no, no thanks. We're not, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna fight you. And so um, that's where we are on the volunteer agreements. We've been hearing that um, they're going to hold, I guess, public hearings. We just heard this yesterday uh, from the administration that volunteer agreements are going to be heating up um, now's the time for tribes to, you know, provide input or comments. We'll be doing a sign-on letter for tribes, um, but there's going to be some type of public process now because that was the other side of them excluding tribes was that they excluded, you know, environmental justice communities as well. And so um, we're not sure what that's going to look like. We didn't get, you know, much clarity on on that process, but it sounds like they're going to open up the voluntary agreements proposal within the Bay Delta uh, plan draft staff report and um, go through that public process. So that's potentially another opportunity for folks to um, advocate and, and make sure that they know that, you know, just like, you know, Katie, you mentioned it, just like US EPA, um, you know, said in their own comment letter, they do not believe that the volunteer agreements are sufficient to protect beneficial uses. And, uh, oh, and what we attach to that is, if they if they can't protect beneficial uses, they definitely can't protect tribal beneficial uses. So um, anyway, these are the things that we're working on. Um, we have a lot, a lot to do, but we're going to keep working and we're going to keep trying to bring, you know, other tribes along with us um, and just try to be as much of a resource as we possibly can. Wow. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was fascinating and infuriating and heartbreaking but um thank you so much for all that you shared too and wow uh and I'm so glad to hear about this this new caucus and everything and I'm glad that you're getting involved in MET I've got to say the way that DWR and and MET and everyone talks about tribes it they make it sound like everyone is best friends everything's great right. at the yeah. At the first um, Bay Delta plan hearing, they Jennifer Pierre, the state water contractors rep, she said that, oh, everything's great with the tribes. And I said, did you hear anything that they said only 30 minutes ago? And I said, did you, have you ever met with them? And she said, no, but you know, we're going to, we're going to. Right. And, and, and they, and here's what we told them when we finally were able to, and, and I believe it was through your help and Charming's help. Um, you guys, you know, were able to kind of let us know that this was occurring, that DWR and some other agencies were really misrepresenting what was um, happening through our tribal consultation, right? And so we we found out that the department and other agencies were misrepresenting how tribes felt about the tunnel. And so, um, you know, one component of tribal consultation, when you enter into consultation, whether it's SB 18 or whether it's under AB 52, 
what the agencies are able to do then is to hide behind confidentiality. So when say, you know, someone from the Met board, you know, says, okay, so how do the tribes feel? What's their stance? Oh, we can't tell you it's confidential under AB 52. And that's actually not correct. And so if they're not able to, you know, if they're not able or willing to share the fact that we oppose the tunnel, then you shouldn't be able to go and misrepresent, you know, how well everything is going and how great of a process it's been. Um, and so that was a, a learning experience for us too. And we realized that um, we needed to also make public statements. We needed, we, we couldn't trust the consultation process. We, you know, we can't trust government, you know, for, you know, to tell the truth. Um, and so we really needed to start making those public comments and, and public statements. And so that's why I think shortly after that, we did make a public announcement and said, you know, I think it was, you know, seven or eight of our tribes in the Delta came out and said, we are opposed. And we want everyone to know that because we're tired of state agencies misrepresenting our positions. Good, good. It's it's constant. It's everyone. It's DWR. It's MET. It's at the um in their press conference when the final EIR came out, the um it was Carrie Buckman and Wade Crowfoot, and they said, Oh no, the tribes have been working really closely with us. And then they said it again for Santa Clarita when they were at their tunnel update. And um, and I mentioned how in chapter 27 it talks about how they would have to remove burial sites, that they would dig up burial sites and move them. And one of the board members. I guess this had never occurred to her. She was shocked. And she said, is that true? And Carrie Buckman said, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's definitely true. It. Right. And, you know, and I won't talk site specific, but I think that, you know, from the very beginning, not, not I think, I know, because when I went back and looked at the environmental documents from the previous iteration of, the, of this um, project, it was all in their own environmental documents. And so when we talked about how culturally sensitive, um, the, the Delta landscape is particularly, you know, around where they want to put uh, intakes, you know, it's not even a question of if, like, you know, you're going to destroy cultural sites, you know, you're going to disturb ancestors, you know, you're going to, you know, continue to deplete, you know, our, our native plants and, and animals and fish species. So it's, you know, again, it's more of that, like, gaslighting and, um, you know, a lot of um, behaviors that really are almost like in a way re-traumatizing. You know, there are times that, you know, I, I have been in rooms with other um, other tribal members and, you know, and people from the indigenous communities, and it's difficult for us to talk about these things. It is like this, this you know, re-traumatizing of the things that have already been stolen, the things that have already been lost. And, you know, nobody would propose to go dig up the cemetery, you know, that's, you know, down in, in the town of Freeport, right? You wouldn't go dig up Lewis and Clark. You wouldn't go do that. But, you know, for some reason, um, which we know what that is, it's okay to, to dig up ancestors and, uh, you know, and pretend like you didn't know. So we, ha we, yeah, you know, it's extremely draining. You know, my boss and I look at each other all the time and we're exhausted, but it's like, we have to keep doing the work. You know, this is, this is what we've been called to do. And so we're, we're going to keep doing it. And we do appreciate so much of the support that we've received from Sierra Club. Um, you guys have been fantastic. You know, you've, you've been wonderful allies. And so we do really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I think we, you know, I, I was going to say we have time for questions, but it looks like folks are answering them in the Q&A. Um, and I think we can continue to do that. Um, we it is it is time for Gia's, um, but this was so fascinating. Thank you so much, Crystal. You're very welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, looking forward to hearing about your bill and I'll see you at MET this week. I'm excited for that because they desperately need to hear from you and can't wait for that. So thank you again, Crystal. Really appreciate it. Awesome. And, Thanks, everyone. See you thank later. You. And um, now we are going to hear from Gia Moreno. Gia is a mother, a teacher, a multicultural educator, and a hood webmaster. She's Native American and Chicana, and she was raised in Hood. She comes from five generations of Hood residents on both sides of her family. Her, her connection to Hood is lifelong. Gia is currently the webmaster and social media contact for the town of Hood and a representative on the Delta National Heritage Area Planning Committee, 
She was formerly the representative for Hood on the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Authority Stakeholder Engagement Committee. In her non-Delta related activities, Gia is a mother of two future Hood residents, a high school ceramics teacher, an artist, and a multicultural educator. That's very impressive. <laughs> thanks, Gia, for being here with us. You're welcome. Um, thanks for having me. I think a lot of the things that Crystal and I are not related, by the way, I <laughs> have the same last name, but we're in this fight together. Um, I think I'm going to uh, piggyback off of a lot of the things that she said and then agree with the things that, that she said about um, the struggle that that we that we're going through um so yeah i was on the stakeholder engagement committee i started um about a year after everyone else did and that was because of um there were a lot of voices from from clarksburg from a couple of different agencies and groups that hood needed to have a representative um because we were left completely out of the conversation um back in I don't know, like 12 years ago, back when it was still uh, BDCP, the maps that they had of uh, the area where they were gonna put the intakes, they didn't have hood on the map. And often if you look at the maps of the tunnel um, project and the different variations of it throughout the years, we're not on the map even now um, because they don't intend for us to be there. Uh, hood is a very unique, uh demographic because a lot of us are uh native american and uh mexican uh indigenous mexican but we're not native californians we are native to new mexico and colorado um sometimes when when they need a token native they try to use me to do that and i i'm very adamant that Hood doesn't speak for the California natives. Hood doesn't speak for the natives of um, the area. They don't. We don't speak for the Miwok. We don't speak for the Nishinan. We don't speak for the night for the Maidu. Um, and we have to be pretty adamant about that. That we are we are still. I don't want to say guests because um, we weren't invited. <laughs> we just ended up here. Um, but. Uh, that they that the tribes of the area need to have their own voice um, and we're fully supportive of of their voice and we take lead from what they want to do uh, like most places in the U.S. anywhere that there is a town or a city it was um, an indigenous sacred space it was a native sacred space so within hood and um, there are numerous you know when we were younger we would find you know, artifacts and things. And there are places where um, there are sacred sites and it's not, um, you know, we've been asked like, oh, where is it? But it's not our place to to give up that information. Um, but we do know that, that that was a place where people lived and, um, you know, since the beginning of time. Um, being on the stakeholder engagement committee, it was, it was very, um, it was like screaming into a void because you would say like, these are all the things that are wrong. This is what's gonna happen. You're gonna destroy us. You're gonna wipe us out. We won't exist as a community. What are you gonna do with the people? And um, it, we were told no, no. And Crystal brought up a point where um, in her, when she was talking about, they say things, but there's no science to back it up. There's no, um, there's no studies to, to support what they're saying. And I always tell them, I'm like, like, I think you you make up these things off of like hopes and dreams, but there's no actual substance behind what you're planning on doing. Um, there's no, the, the tunnel itself and the project itself is so multi-part because you have the construction of everything, um, which is going to be completely destructive on its own. But then after that, you have to look at what the ramifications of this project are. And um, as indigenous people, we look at things, um, there's a concept of seven generations. So you look at the next seven generations forward. Like you can't just focus on yourself and different tribes have different concepts of it because we're not a monolith. Um, but the general like kind of feeling is that like we, we're here temporarily and we have to look at how we're gonna leave things for the people that come after us. Um, and so when I ask like, well, if you're gonna take the water and you kill the, you're killing the, the smelt now and you're gonna kill the salmon, 
what happens after that because it's a chain reaction and like crystal was saying that the delta isn't just the delta as we you know the the border that they have it now it's a chain reaction so what happens in the delta is going to affect everything going up all the waterways so we have i have a connection with the native people that are up at sites and up on the feather river and we're trying to fight um all of that because it's it's a chain it's a connection um there's you know when when they ended the stakeholder engagement committee it was like well you know here's a couple of community benefits and go on you know go about your business we've checked our box um there was no regard to anything and there were times when we would you know I would get in arguments with their engineers about the effects it would have on hood because they want to make a haul road from intake three down along a railroad track to Lambert Road. And I'm like, well, you're gonna have to take out houses to put this road to put this haul road in. And they're like, no, we won't. And I'm like, yeah, you're gonna have to take out houses. You're gonna have to take out at least two houses. And they insisted and insisted and they pulled out the map and they're like, no, there's enough space. And I'm like, I played there, you know, my entire childhood. There's no room there for a road. You're going to have to take out the houses. And finally, they were like, oh, we will have to remove two houses. Um, we had a meeting in Hood one time. And uh, what happens in Hood is that all the water from the storm drains flows out into a field, into a ditch. And then that ditch is released. If it gets too full, it's pumped out into the Snodgrass Slough. So we were like, well, what happens when it floods? And they're like, when what floods? We're like, the area where you're going to put intake three, every time it rains heavy, like you say it's going to, um, it's going to flood. So what are you going to do about the water that would normally fill up the area where you're going to put intake three? And they argued and argued. And we were like, we've been watching that field flood for our entire lives what are you talking about and they were like no it's not registered as a flood flag. so there's no real science or real like evidence for a lot of the things that they're going to do another thing is that they want to pull the tunnel muck out and let it dry next to the tunnel and um, the intakes and we were asking okay well what about the smell and they were like it doesn't smell but if you ever go down to any part of the delta and you dig your hand in the river and you pull it out it stinks um <laughs> the nature of of the water of the water the, the muck it stinks um and they were like well no it, it'll be fine and we're like well what if it dries and the delta breeze kicks in what if this happens and what if that happens and it's all very much like um no that's not gonna happen it won't happen what if the tunnel cracks the tunnel won't crack are you sure about that and there it's which is ironic because they're whole idea their whole um propaganda i call it for what they're doing is they need to build this tunnel because at some point the levees are going to crack a, a massive earthquake is going to come and the levees are going to crack the levees haven't the last time we had i think a, a large scale issue with the levee was like 75 years ago um and there are all kinds of plans in place if I mean, right now the the water's pretty high. I don't know if you've driven down, but the water's pretty high. Um, everybody's watching it. When it gets to a certain point, they have cars that drive up and down 24 hours a day and they watch for bubbles and, and issues. And if something does happen, there are people around and there's 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 protocols in place to help remedy if anything happens to the levee. So nothing's going on. Um, but if there's something strong enough to crack a levee, wouldn't it crack a tunnel? Um, <laughs> so it's, and we asked, well, what happens if, if the tunnel cracks, you know, and all the water seeps out into the, into the soil, um, what are you going to do? That's not going to happen. Okay. What if that's not going to happen? So you have no plan in place for at any point if that tunnel does crack. No. So there's no safety. So this is supposed to be for, for our safety. This tunnel's for, to transport water and for the safety of us Delta people, but there's no, there's no plans for safety or anything like that. And the more that we ask, the more, like I said, it's like screaming into a void. Like there's no, no response. And it's all like, um, hopes and dreams are going to, are going to push this project forward. Um, <laughs> uh, the other part of that is, um, being on that committee, I get asked to go and do, um, like a lot of talks, which is, it's fine. I didn't, 
my area of emphasis in my life before this was art and education. Like I do multicultural education, diversity, equity. Um, and then I was kind of shoved into this. Like I was, I was pulled into it because out of necessity, um, which I, sometimes I mind it because it's a little bit hard to continually hear the same voices and a lot of them because I do have a connection with a lot of indigenous people and native groups is like hearing all these native people like crystal said it's it's re-traumatizing because you have to deal with the fact that um this area has already been colonized california was one of the most brutal places for um for colonization and like with much of the the west it was double colonized first by the spanish and then by the Americans, and then now this is happening. And it's a, well, and then you have to look at things like relocation. That's why there's so many Native Americans here that are not just California Natives. There's a lot from other places because they were forced to to come over here. So it's a lot of things and it's a lot of trauma that we're, we're working through while protecting ourselves, while protecting other people, while protecting the environment. Um, and just to, to sit there and have them, you know, like, oh, here, I'm gonna check your little Native box. Um, without actually taking into consideration the the issues um, that surround the different native communities is is really hard. Um, so I don't know what <laughs> I got kind of off track, but um, it, it was it was a farce the 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 committee um, being on it because people would always ask me why are you on it and I'm like. If I'm the one voice in that whole thing telling them that it's wrong, then I'm going to be that one voice. I wasn't, luckily. But what my what would have happened if there wasn't a, those of us on there fighting for it was that they would have filled it with a bunch of people that were just saying yes the entire time, handpicked people that were going to say that there's no problem. Because they told me, they were like, oh, now that you're here, we can't say, like, you know, no news is good news. But the idea was that if we didn't speak up, that nothing was wrong and that we didn't care what was going to happen to us because we didn't have we didn't speak up and the thing about hood is that it's filled with a lot of um people that did ag most of their lives they don't have any need for computers or the internet or um <laughs> things like that um and a lot of people are older like uh you know some of my older relatives have never even turned a computer on because they just haven't had the need to ever do so uh, let alone have an email account or know how to log on to a Zoom or um, a WebEx meeting or whatever. Um, so it was taking this disenfranchised community. And so I have a couple people, I call them my handlers. They remind me to make sure that my face is nice when I'm in Zooms and not rolling my eyes. And, you know, to, to my grandma calls it being less, um, <laughs> to, to tone it down a little bit. But, um, but even with with them, they're like, you know, because I came out swinging and I was, I was like, you're attacking a, a, a small, low income, elderly, uh, indigenous Latino community. We are lambs for your slaughter because you didn't expect us to come out um, as hard as we did. And they weren't expecting um, me, I guess, because they thought we were a bunch of little uneducated podunk. <laughs> country people and like I like to you know rub all the things in their face like hi I'm here I have you know multiple college degrees I have a master's I'm I work for the EPA I know all your secrets um and to, and to be a part of that that fight has been tremendous for me it is hard like I said there was a point um this one of the last um public comment periods where there just happened to be a lot of native people on the on the the group chat and to hear them and just like you know when we were done I I went to my dad and I was like crying because I'm like I'm so tired of of having to hear native people have the same fight that they've had for the last you know 400 years like this is it's too much some days um but you got to get up and you got to keep doing it um and that's one of the things that I like to tell Met when I meet with them um you know like 
by the time, you know, and it, it might be mean, it might, <laughs> but, but it's the truth, you know, by the time that you get to start this project after lawsuits and all that stuff, some of you people won't be in this room because they're all, you know, a lot of them are older and I'm like, I'll be old. And by when, and if I, you know, I will outlast a lot of people on that board. And then my kids will pick up that, that torch and they will carry on with that too. Cause then they're ready. Um, they shouldn't have to be, I hope that it ends you know, before, before I do, but, um, but it, it will be a fight. And like Crystal said, it will be our standing rock. It will be, um, I have equated it to, uh, those guys, I remember they like Montana or whatever, uh, you know, and they're, and, and they did that standoff. I'm like, that'll be hood. You know, we, we, we don't have a choice. You're going to, um, we will be there and we will bring people and people will come and we will, there will be a protest and it will not be good. Um, for your your project but we were willing to to dig in and and protect our our communities and not just hood but the rest of the delta and the other communities that are surrounding us because they are attacking the small places i mean up on the feather river and the sites and um you know all, all the places where they want to put a dam is pretty much some small indigenous community that doesn't have a whole lot of resources to defend themselves Thank you, Gia. You're like welcome. This. Um, I'm glad you all can't see me crying over here from Zoom. <laughs> I think the filter really helps with that, but oh, wow. Okay. Well, thank you. That was powerful. And um, I am so sorry that you have to keep getting traumatized over and over again and sharing your story with people who aren't listening. And it's just, it hurts. Um, I'm sorry for that. We have time for some questions. Um, Steve Hayes wants to know, to what extent is the historic town of Locke involved? I think he means with the stakeholder engagement committee. Um, uh, Deirdre, I have to jump in. Uh, we have a guy named uh, Doug Shaw and he's involved in, in Locke. Um, uh, with the with the Chinese community and their uh, the museum and their historical association, and he's in um, a lot of the the groups that he was on the stakeholder engagement committee as well, and he helps um, bring their perspective um, into it. So he they they help. Um, it's less of an impact for them, and sometimes. Um, <laughs> so there's there's multiple delta legacy communities and um one of the things that bothered me in the beginning I was, I was like oh well you know yeah you guys are like oh we're not going to talk about you know alternate alternate alternatives to the intakes because they're not in your neighborhood they're just right here at mine and in Cortland and thanks for not saying anything before but you know I have to think of you know how they they need to protect their own um communities as well so but now we're kind of all on the same page of like no intakes no tunnels you know or or we're the delta as a as a whole and that's um i'm i'm liking that that we're all working cohesively right now good good love that um one more question from the chat and then i'll take some raised hands steve also wants to know about the state historic preservation office um i suppose how involved they are and or your take on it from um this participation with the stakeholder engagement and the stakeholder engagement committee um shut down a year or two ago right mm -hmm. yeah okay um well they left a lot of historical stuff off uh specifically hood as a historic community um but there was a lot of other things that i looked at and i was like mm, it's older than that we had a, um, a gentleman come out from, that was connected somehow to Delta Protection Commission to come in and have me walk around town and talk about the historic parts of Hood and, um, you know, when it was built. I <laughs> I was raised in the house of the son of the guy that built Hood. So there was a lot of artifacts and articles and things. So I'm like, I have like a lot of random knowledge about the town in my head. I, I'm like, that's my thing. Um, but they did, they left a lot of it off. And I was, I would hope that there, the Delta is so historic and so amazing. And you don't really hear a lot about it because it's not 
there's not that direct connection to the gold rush like there is with like you know um like say amador or placerville or something um but the delta has just such a deep rich ag history and i don't know if it's because that history centers on the japanese the chinese the mexicans and the filipinos um like most people don't even know that there was like there was a huge dutch population in the delta um <laughs> and they were the ones that first did a lot of the colonizing um but yeah they don't really help out and they don't help to like um the heritage area that's what we're trying to focus on more is like looking at that history and bringing it out and having um, like for me, education is huge because that's, you know, my job, but I want to be able to be like, hey, like, because, you know, people don't know these stories, like, you know, the the Delta has such a huge, deep history of, of agriculture and um, multiculturalism in California. Yeah. Wow. Fasc how fascinating and lucky that you live in the, the founder's house. That's <laughs> incredible. Um, uh, we have time. Uh, we're going to take a break at 1.30 for bathrooms and water and all of that, but uh, we've got Two folks who want to ask questions, Sydney. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hi. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yep. So I wanted to mention earlier, um, you were saying something about um what was it? Something regarding um staying in the loop of opportunities to take action on things and like I don't remember but I'm just it's a lot for me um so, I was just yeah. wondering like action and particularly on what like you, you were saying something about um either sending us an email or signing up for something to stay yeah. in the loop of, I'll um yeah. I'll send out any any Thing relevant that comes out of this so when we hear more about the bill that crystal's working on i'll share that um any discussions and actions I'll, I'll definitely share with everyone in this group after that and then and then i saw on the agenda about calling in and commenting on the sfpuc budget yeah i'll talk about that during the break yeah because i'm actually going to eat lunch right now too it, it's just i'm trying to like listen and multitask it's like yeah, really hard to me. so yeah. I, I don't know if i should leave or do whatever you got to do i'll definitely send all of the links out and um yeah we'll have a break opportunity for folks to get some water hydrate go to the bathroom so thanks sydney well will there be other opportunities to take action on the sfpuc thing if i don't do it today yes yes definitely i'll send the link out to everyone for sure Thank okay. you. All right. And then Tom is um, one of our amazing engineers. He knows a lot about the um, the tunnel. And I imagine he's going to talk about what would happen if that tunnel were to crack. Tom? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams, actually also a professor in geology at UC Davis and got my PhD at UC Berkeley, including parts of the Delta. So uh, I do know something about tunnels. Also, having been the environmental control supervisor for the Red Line Phase One downtown LA, and that was in the 80, 1980s, and we had a group from Shanghai, China, coming to see what we were doing. And I told them at that time that Shanghai was one of the world's worst possible places to build tunnels. Why? All soft ground. If you're going to build a tunnel, rock is a lot better than clay. And one of the problems with the Delta is it's all clay. And you might say, here's the real issue. You're going to have to build shafts for the tunnel boring machines. Now those shafts have to be fixed to a very hard bottom so that they don't sink while you're doing construction. The problem is that when you send a tunnel boring machine out of the shaft, it's no longer being supported by the shaft. 
it starts being supported by the surrounding clay and water. Oh, also, do you know that there's a gas storage facility underground in the Delta along the path of almost any of the tunnel alternatives? And it goes up and down because they pump gas in, it goes up. They pump gas out, the ground subsides. But if there's going to be an earthquake, the connection between the tunnels and all of the shafts will break. And that will be a real problem. You might say, breaking a delta levee, at least it's exposed and you can do something about it. Fixing a tunnel that's broken off of a shaft is virtually impossible. Nobody has that much money and time to spend. So the real issue is the tunnels will float in the muck, but the shafts will not. And it will be the breaking point of the shaft and the tunnel. We have the same problem in the downtown LA metro, the transit, the subway. You might say the tunnels are okay by themselves. The stations are okay by themselves, but the connection between the tunnels and the station, and or in your case, the shaft, will not be all right during an earthquake. So, might say focus on the fact that they they can't keep the tunnel connected to the shaft and if it breaks all hell breaks loose so might say i put my contact on address in the chat but i can't copy the chat so uh, we need to send the chat out uh, afterwards but the tunnel and the shaft are the most important thing. The tunnel and the inlet are the second most important thing. And I might say the inlets may be fixed and well piled and everything, but where they connect to a tunnel, you got a problem. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, and Lionel has made a few comments in the chat. Um, the chat is is a great spot to chat with each other, give comments, and you know respond to everything we're hearing. But if you have questions, please use the Q and A feature. Um, when we have time to answer publicly, we will. But we have been answering um, written responses to the questions, um, just to make sure we can hear from as many folks as possible. Um, so thank you so much, Gia. And I was going to ask you Steve's question, but you answered it. So thank you. And yes, drilling um, would definitely cause damage to a lot of these buildings. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and they, they they haven't been able to get an accurate soil sample because um, the property owners aren't allowing them on the properties for obvious reasons. So they're taking soil samples from different locations that aren't really... Um, like from roads, which are already kind of impacted because they've been the same roads for hundreds of years. Um, but like um, Tom said, the, the Delta, if you've ever looked at, if you ever get a chance to look at the historic, like pre-colonization kind of like early contact maps of of the Delta, everything flooded, the whole, um, you know, the whole Central Valley flooded. So all of the, which what makes the Delta so good for farming is that it has a lot of rich, nutrients and sediments and soils and and things that are there so the ground is soft so it's it's like silts and sands and and clay um so it wouldn't be um there's nothing firm there to hold it the whole thing would shake if there was you know this massive you know giant earthquake but thank you so much for having me and asking questions Absolutely. i appreciate it yeah thank you so much that was really interesting and um fantastic uh, perspective so thank you so much dia um, folks, we are going to take a break so everyone can go to use the restroom, get some water. We'll come back at 1.40 and hear from Cynthia Cortez with Restore the Delta. Um, so go ahead if you need to. I'm also going to put up the, um, the links that I was discussing um, while you're uh, taking a break. And um, that would be... 
Here we go. So I'm hoping everyone can see this. This is, um, I have two QR codes here. On the left is what Sydney mentioned. Um, this will take you to a sign up link where you can stay updated on urgent actions in the Bay Delta or big news. So um, when that bill comes out, we'll share that. When we hear about water rights and petitions, we discuss those in some of our meetings, um, but we will, and we, we meet on Wednesdays every week to discuss these things and happy to share that information with you as well. But if you use this QR code on the left, that will, um, that will keep you informed on the big, big things happening. All the big votes, anytime we need public comments, things like that. And um, on the right, we have a QR code to talk about, uh, well, it'll give you some background info, but the SFPUC, that's the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, they are planning their design drought. And a lot of agencies do this. They use the worst case scenario for their planning, which might be because, you know, they they want to be prepared for the worst situation, but also, it's a lot more expensive when you do that. You use a lot more water, you use a lot more supplies, and their design drought is based on a one in 25,000 year uh, drought. And um, some of these plans are, because of that, some of their, their plans are going to make the cost of water really, really high. We're looking at 43% increases in water bills in 10 years. Um, 10 to 20 years. So it's it's going to be really expensive. There's some more background information on that there. Um, and then also SFPUC stopped allowing for virtual um, participation, which is really not accessible for anyone who has, you know, work, school, kids, all those kinds of things. It's really difficult. So we're encouraging people to email them. And if you want to talk about the inaccessibility, you are welcome to do that um, too. So again, that's the QR code on the right. I mentioned some special projects we could use help with at Sierra Club at the top. That's my email address, I'm Katie. And if you are interested in any of those, or if you have any questions about anything you heard today, please reach out. I, if it's something I don't know, I will um, reach out to any of these fine folks and get you the information. Um, but we are looking for Help on a few different specific things. If you are a photographer, or videographer, especially if you live near the Delta or not too far from it, we could use some help there. Um, we heard from both Crystal and Gia that it is very traumatizing to relive something so painful as colonization over and over again and talk about the impacts. Um, you know, the, like I said, at the Santa Clarita um, water board meeting, they were discussing, or I brought up how the, um, as part of the tribal cultural analysis, burial sites will have to be moved. And some of the board members had never even considered that, which is often true of most major infrastructure projects that happens constantly in the Americas that happens all the time. It's not something they had thought about. Some board members were shocked and horrified by this as they should be and DWR is like yeah you know that's that's kind of what happened so they they are aware that that's part of it um but all this is painful and traumatizing and um I've been thinking about without having to ask people to share these painful stories over and over again at multiple water agencies multiple public comment sessions especially when it seems like they you know, are ignored, are not responded. I'd like to film these stories. So we only have to share it once so that then they can be sent to different agencies um, to, you know, we can transcribe them, turn them into letters, turn them into comments uh, with your permission, of course, and then share them so that people don't have to keep reliving these painful um, and painful moments and get traumatized all over again. So that's something we would like to do. Um, and that's, we'd love to hear from anyone impacted. So maybe you're a resident of the Delta, maybe you're a member of a tribe, maybe you are someone in SoCal who will have to pay for this tunnel if it were to be built and not actually receive the water. That's the case if you live near San Gabriel Valley, if you live in the gateway cities, um, anyone who lives in Metz district has to pay property taxes to Metropolitan Water District. Maybe you don't own a home, but you rent. Well, you see you see the cost of that reflected in the cost of your rent. Probably one of the reasons why rent is so high in Southern California. 
Um, we pay through property taxes for water, but we also pay through water rates. And as they figure out the bond discussion issues right now about how will the state water contractors pay for all of these projects, um, you know, things are going to be very expensive. And then so there are some areas where they pay metropolitan through property taxes for the water, but they have other sources of water. They have local groundwater. So they're paying twice or they're paying for water that they're not getting. And if you live in one of those areas, you know, let's speak up about how expensive this water is and the cost of living in California is out of control. So let's talk about that. Uh, we'll also be, you know, now that we, we know that the vote is a good three years away, hopefully more with um, any delays we can do with lawsuits on permitting and planning. But if we have at least three years away, um, then, you know, this is a good time to educate folks who are not as familiar in the Delta, I'm sure these topics are on everyone's mind every day, all day. In other parts of California, in the desert, in Southern California, it's maybe not as well known. And we would like to um, meet with people in a bit more of a one-on-one -on -one basis and in groups and really get the story out there, have dialogue, have conversations with people. So we'd like to do classroom visits, meet with churches, other community groups and discuss these and the more folks who join us, the more people we can reach. So if you're interested in helping out with that there or in the Delta, really anywhere, it's it's always important to have these conversations wherever we are. So reach out to me if you're interested in that. And we would also like to, um, I've got some projects that are are good for folks who are maybe a bit more introverted. Maybe you, you don't wanna talk to a classroom full of college students or high school students. Maybe you're someone who likes to stay behind the screen and never talk to anyone. And that's fantastic too, because we could use, we use any kind of talents you have, whatever it is, anyone who wants to get involved, we will find a way to um, use your talents and, you know, make you an effective part of this movement. So we would also love to do some deep digging. There are some things we're looking for in um, records, me uh, meeting minutes, and other things, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that offline. And uh, we could also use a lawyer for something, and I'll tell you more details about that offline as well. So if any of these projects are interested, uh, interesting to you, if you have a finance background, we do have, um, and even came up in the Q&A chat, we do have someone that we're talking to about a really in-depth look, but we also, um, we would love volunteers who can use publicly available information. There's a lot of different things that we're looking to do with numbers and finance and happy to um, discuss that. And then we are also looking for, if you have um, some pretty extensive ag knowledge or maybe water engineering knowledge, whatever knowledge you have of other things that Metropolitan Water District can do to, um, do some other projects that would reduce their reliance on the Bay Delta and help make everyone a little more self-sufficient, that would be fantastic. So please share those ideas with me. We would love to hear from you. And um, and Diane, um, I'm, I'm sorry if you thought it was 12 to one. No, we have two more speakers. We, um, I believe that was in the event invitation. No, we are now gonna hear from Cynthia from Restore the Delta. So, all right, it is now 1.40 and um, break's over if you'd like to come back to us. And um, Cynthia, I am going to put the spotlight on you now and just trying to figure out how to. Molly, can you make the, put the spotlight on her? One second, and okay, here we go. So Cynthia is a policy analyst with Restore the Delta. She graduated from the University of the Pacific in 2022 with a degree in environmental science. Cynthia joins, joined Restore the Delta as a climate water advocate 
performing water quality testing and contributed to air quality research. As the policy analyst, she monitors and engages with state and federal agencies for the protection of water quality for communities and tribes. I'm really fascinated with what she has to say. Thank you so much, Satya. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this webinar. Um, I hope, can you hear me well? Okay, perfect. I'm not in the most desirable setting, um, unfortunately, but um, I'm happy to be here and share space with all the other wonderful speakers that um, were part of today's webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and give a little background on Restore the Delta and also talk about uh, the coalition that we work with. So Restore the Delta is a um, nonprofit organization that is committed to restoring and protecting the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, also known as the Bay Delta or just the Delta. Um, our goal is really to empower communities to become guardians of the estuary um, through participation in government processes and waterway monitoring. So really empowering them to do a lot of the work that we do and giving them the confidence to participate in these processes through knowledge and also training. Um, our organization has experienced major growth. It has expanded in the last three to four years from a four person organization to now we have a team of 12 um, that really allow us to do some of the aspirational work, but also still kind of fight the front lines. Um, you know, there's a tunnel, VAs and all these projects. Um, in addition to my work, I also help coordinate our Delta Tribal Environmental Coalition, also known as DTEC, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, today, I will be sharing about Restore the Delta's work um, with the Delta Tribal Environmental Coalition, DTEC, I'll just say DTEC, um, and share some of the different avenue, avenues that we are using uh, to restore and protect our waterways. So just to talk about a little bit of the programs that we have, um, we have currently Sarah, our sustainable agriculture and land manager who is working on informative handbooks for the Delta region um, and our farmers to promote more sustainable farming practices. She um, is also working to connect farmers with resources that help facilitate the transition to uh, sustainable farming practices. Um, the two handbooks that she's actually cur currently working on is um, the rice farming handbook, which will provide comprehensive insights on the future of rice cultivation, address um, addressing crucial challenges there. There's also the wetland restoration handbook which will serve as a valuable resources resource for farmers uh, to transition into wetland restoration. Um, in addition to that, she also helps manage our workforce pathway project to connect farmers embracing sustainable um, agriculture and connecting them with interns and community members who are interested in pursuing this in a career or are just interested in general. Um, the job also helps kind of create higher paying job job opportunities and fostering that community connections. Um, in addition to sustainable agriculture, we also do work in flood management and flood plain restoration. Part of that is our Mormon Slough restoration project. Mormon Slough is a channel that was rejected for levy upgrades in previous decades by the Army Corps of Engineers due to low benefit ratios and low income development, development analysis. Uh, we have partnered with agencies, tribes, and other organizations to create a plan for needed flood infrastructure and to implement, implement a floodplain restoration project that will provide multi-benefits for regional environmental and economic development needs. Um, the project is located in South Stockton, which is a historically red line community. So the disinvestment in this part of the city is ob obvious. We lack basic services like reliable public transportation, healthy and affordable housing, livable wages, and just access to healthcare services. Um, so the overall goal is really to begin creating an inclusive, more holistic plan with enhanced floodplain protection. Um, 
provide the community with those green spaces and also increase recreation in the areas to help community reconnect with those waterways. Um, and finally, the last part um, program that I'll be talking on is our harmful algal bloom water quality monitoring program. I think it was about four years ago uh, that Restore the Delta started its harmful algal bloom water quality monitoring program. and. Um, I'll say HABS for short. HABS is, you know, that really bright, for those of you that are not familiar with it, it's um the bright kind of electric green water that you usually see along waterways during the summer and has like a very foul uh, smell to it. And there's a collection of things that contribute to the formation of HABS. One is stagnant water. Two is the excess of nutrients specifically phosphorus and nitrogen, and also high water temperature, which um, usually stagnant water uh, tends to have higher uh, water, a higher water temperature. Um, and with increased flows, it helps decrease uh, water temperature. So there is extensive research that shows that low flows in, um, low flows are the primary driver of HABs formation and it's something that we advocate for with the State Water Resources Control Board. But really the goal of our monitoring program is to fill in data gaps for the state for HAB sightings in the Stockton area, um, as well as highlight how HABs are an environmental justice and public health concern in the Delta region. Um, and we know that there's isn't just HAB signs in Stockton, it's they're seen throughout the whole Delta region. Um, and we have also trained tribal and community partners in water quality and testing in the Delta so that they're able to also help contribute to filling in these data gaps that um, our organization just doesn't have the capacity and bandwidth to do. So now that I've shared a little bit about the work that Restore the Delta does, um, we often kind of use a football analogy to describe the work that we do. We have, you know, our office offense team that's working on the more aspirational work. And then we have our defense team working on policy and really fighting for the protection of the Delta to allow our aspirational work to succeed. So part of that is our work with the Delta Tribal Environmental Coalition or DTECT formed by coalition partners. Um, we have three tribes, Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians, which Crystal, um, who spoke earlier, is a part of uh, the Wyndham and Wintu tribe. Um, and we recently joined is Buena Vista Rancheria of Miwok Indians. Also is um, also part of that coalition is Little Manila Rising, another nonprofit in Stockton that we work very closely with. Yeah. So together we filed a petition for rulemaking with the US Environmental Protection Agency, seeking for the timely and meaningful update of the Bay Delta Plan. Um, and this happened back in December of 2022. And I believe it was last summer, the EPA finally accepted um, our petition for investigation. And um, in addition to that, DTEC is are also complainants in an ongoing investigation conducted by the EPA under the titles under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act um, into the State Water Board's discriminatory management of the Bay Delta water quality. Um, we are thankfully represented by our wonderful legal team from Stanford from Stanford's Environmental Legal Clinic that really help with the legal proceedings and also help with some of our capacity um, issues. So for a little bit of background, um, and I know some of this hopefully isn't too redundant, but it just really helps understand our petition and complaint a little bit more. So the State Water Resources Control Board um, has its water quality control plan, also referred to as the Bay Delta Plan, that is used to adopt objectives and water quality standards and the US EPA has oversight authority of the State Water Board to ensure that the water quality standards 
that are being adopted by the board are compliant with the Clean Water Act and are protective of the beneficial uses as defined by the Clean Water Act. So some of those beneficial uses include domestic, municipal, agriculture use, um, the protection of fish habitat, water recreation, among many more. Um, so the petition for rulemaking requests that the US EPA enact uh, its oversight authority to intervene in the process to update the Bay Delta plan because the, the board has failed to do so in a timely manner. So the state board is required to review water quality standards every three years. It has not performed a comprehensive review in nearly 30 years. The last um, was in, I believe, 1995. Um, the board is currently in the process of updating the Bay Delta plan, plan, but that process just continues to be delayed because um, the state board is entertaining the private negotiation of voluntary agreements, and that's excluding tribes and communities from what other what would otherwise be a public process, again, funded, um, receiving federal funds. So the board's actions and inactions at that are really causing an ecological harm that is disproportionately affecting um, our tribes and communities of color. So this kind of leads me to talk more about the ongoing investigation being conducted by the EPA um, that's under the Title VI, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and they're investigating into the state water boards, again, discriminate, discriminatory management of the Bay Delta. So Title VI of the Civil Rights Act says um, that no person in the state of California on the grounds of race, color, or national origin shall be excluded from participation or denied benefits or be subject to discrimination under any project or activity receiving federal or financial funding. So the Title, title VI itself um, prohibits policies that are intentionally discriminatory, while EPA's more um, implementing regulations uh, have addition additionally like prohibit facially neutral policies and practices that may lead to disparate impacts. Um, the State Water Board is responsible for ensuring that their policies and procedures are not discriminatory in an intentional or un intentional way that results in these disparate impacts. So we have had uh, like water board members admit that if the water rights system and the way that water in California is uh, managed were to be created today, it would be very, it would look a lot different um, than what we see today. And what we say to that is that, you know, you can't change history, um, but you, we can definitely hold the state and federal agencies accountable for continuing to function under the system. So really, we highlight to them that discrimination is institutionalized into California's current water management system. And the Delta Conveyance Project, the voluntary agreements, they're just a continuation of California's history of colonization, marginalization, and genocide. Um, so with our petition, we are asking for the designation of tribal beneficial uses, the adoption of HAB standard, and the adoption of protective water quality standards. Um, uh, yeah, the adoption of protective water quality standards that um, are protective of our beneficial uses. Uh, we have also asked that we have also asked in our petition that permitting for new infrastructure projects that would include the tunnel um, and the adoption of exclusionary policies like the VAs be withheld. Um, so at the current moment, our petition is in a very critical stage. Um, the EPA has started its investigation into our civil rights petition and we are entering negotiations with EPA, all while the board continues its planning process to update the Bay Delta plan. And we 
as it was mentioned earlier, we are learning that DWR is moving forward with the planning for the Delta Conveyance Project. Um, so an important component of our petition is that permitting for the tunnel be withheld until the issues that we have brought before the EPA are resolved. Um, and we continue to work with the EPA to keep our petition and complaint moving forward. We are, we are really optimistic that our petition will be resolved. And if so, permitting for the tunnel will be delayed. Voluntary agreements will not move forward. Um, water quality standards that are protective of our tribes and communities will be adopted in an expeditious manner. Um, and if we could get adequate protection in the Delta, in the Bay Delta plan, in this iteration of the Bay Delta plan, it will be evident that the Delta tunnel does not comply with that plan and neither do the VAs. And that would allow for more of our aspirational work to succeed. So not, and it, that's not just our work that we're doing with RTD, but also the tribes, the work of our tribes um, that are doing amazing rest restoration projects. Um, and if we really want these restoration projects to be successful, um, we need a restored delta and that a delta that's protective. So all while we continue to advocate for um, agencies to engage, all this is happening while we also advocate for agencies to engage with us in a meaningful way um, you know, including stakeholders in the decision making process at the start, not after the fact, you know, and also ensure that that those actions and that inclusion inclusion leads to real change and um, they move um, away from kind of a check the box mentality that they've been working under right now. Um, but yeah, that's uh, all I had to share today, and I'm happy. Um, to answer any questions. Thank you, Cynthia. That was fascinating and kind of the ray of hope that we need. I, I love that you have all these avenues and that's some really creative, creative thinking. Um, I was thinking with the civil rights piece of it, um, interesting that the EPA is helping with the civil rights. If, um, if you hit any roadblocks there, do you think that could be like an ACLU type thing and other civil rights attorneys, those kind of folks that would maybe help with all of this or um, you think like the the agency route is really just kind of what makes the most sense. At the moment, it's that's the avenue that um, we've decided to take, and we really depend on our um, attorneys at Stanford to give us guidance on what are the best avenues. Um, I wasn't with Restore the Delta yet when the decision to proceed with those two, um, the petition and complaint was decided on. But I know to my understanding is that that was per the guidance of our Stanford attorneys to um, use these two separate avenues to kind of help in achieving our end goal. Awesome. Thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions for Cynthia, now would be the time if you want to raise your hand. Um, I was also thinking, so um, Crystal mentioned that the tribal beneficial uses became like recognized by the state in 2017, but then you're saying that they're not recognized. Do you mean like specifically within these Delta um, projects or they they were recognized, but like been completely ignored this whole time? So the thing, and maybe um, Crystal would be able to speak more on this, but when it comes to tribal beneficial uses in this past iteration of the draft staff report for the Bay Delta plan um, that was just released, I think it was last September, um, they outlined definitions for what a tribal beneficial use would be like, but it doesn't provide, those are not designated um, and there's no plan of implementation for those tribal beneficial uses. Uh, so in a way, at the moment, they're kind of like empty promises, which is why we are looking for the designation of TBUs. Okay. All right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I just want to say that 
Jenny Madsen said, wow, this is really inspiring, such important work. And thank you for explaining so clearly, which is true that I, I didn't understand all of the connections until you explained this. So thank you for that. And yeah. um, the yeah, there, there's a lot of moving parts. And sure. like I mentioned, um, I came in a little bit later in this process. So I really had to kind of um, dive into the weeds and make sure to entangle them, be able to like properly um, communicate that to our um, our following so if there is any questions and then if any way I was like confusing it was confusing I'm happy to answer those questions too yeah thank you for that yeah that was it was fascinating and that was really made a lot of things clear in my mind so appreciate that thank you Cynthia and um, if anyone has questions you continue to add, can continue to add questions in the Q&A section um, oh you know what we have one more um Steve wants to know what roles do resource conservation districts participate that overlay in the Delta region? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Um, there might be a typo in here. What roles do resource conservation districts um, participate in that overlay in the Delta region? So I guess maybe the relationship with resource conservation districts. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure what the relationship would be there, but I can definitely look into and do a little bit more research in that and get back with a okay. response. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we do have another raised hand. Oh, Steve, go ahead. Sorry for the typo there, but um, are you acquainted with resource conservation districts and what their uh, responsibilities are under the Public Resources Code, uh, Division 9, under the state constitution. If you do, you're way ahead of everybody else. <laughs> Took me too many years to learn. I personally am not, but I am constantly trying to grow and learn, expand my knowledge in these fields, you know, like, especially in California, learning there's like such an extensive history of how we got to today's water rights system and water management system. And um, as I kind of start off my career, I'm really trying to expand my knowledge as much as I can. So I really appreciate you bringing that to my attention. It's definitely something I will look into. Yeah. Uh, Do you have one more? Looks, I'm off mute. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, you may find some uh, friends in that family. It's very obscure. They've been irrelevant until the droughts, all the fires, and the state agencies, in particular um, under the California Natural Resources Agency, have been looking at how they would be much more effective and more proactive as it relates to all of these, uh, let's say, climate change uh, impacted uh, experiences that we're having you know, with tree mortality. But the Delta, um, you know, is a vast region that uh, RCDs uh, could play a role in, but they need to know what are the uh, challenges. And you may have to do it, but you had a wonderful list. I, I love to see it, you know, in uh, writing because you really present a lot of things that Restore the Delta wasn't doing in the past. So I'm much more encouraged because you're looking at things in a let's say non-political let's get the work done that needs to be done that's going to reduce dependency on the delta or protect it and enhance it so it becomes totally irrelevant to have hard infrastructure like a single tunnel now it used to be two but now a single tunnel maybe there's some other lower impact ways using technology. So I don't know to what extent you have uh, technology in there, as there, but you did bring up about like water use efficiency and uh, under CDFA and DWRs, the sweep program, that'd be very beneficial to farmers, uh, state water efficiency enhancement program. But technologies can be, uh, you know, they talk about AI and I'm kind of skeptical that AI is gonna answer everything. I, I think it still takes a little bit of something between the shoulders, but uh, there are technologies that you can do a lot more real time management of water. And unfortunately the State Water Project, Central Valley Project, they're 
they're decades behind on how to do that. But uh, the state of California has mandated it. So another aspect would be uh, uh, SIGMA, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. I know we're talking about the Delta right at the moment. However, it's putting bookends and uh, putting everybody's head in the vice for irrigation districts and water agencies that thou shalt by 2040 do these things. So it's almost like we don't have to do the heavy lifting on legislation. The laws are there. And uh, I don't think anything's going to change uh, there in Sacramento, quote, politically. And that that gives us some almost ample time to address things. Of course, we are talking about the Delta, and it is, you know, uh, from my perspective, um, something of urgency, since it uh, looks like they're trying to fast track it. Uh, thank you for that. Um... Deidre, I think you shared your screen a little early. Um, did we lose Cynthia? Uh, no, I, I, I saw that the screen was shared, so I wanted to make sure I didn't interrupt anything. And, you know, thank you so much for that information. You know, our growth, it's really um, a result of our executive directors, Barbara, um, continued uh, commitment. Barbara's at the helm? Yes. Yeah. She's still at the helm. Wow, that's great. Yeah, she's still our executive director, and you know it's her com really continued commitment to the work that we do, and the dedication to now really passing down the knowledge to the newer generation. So as we continue to grow as an organization and kind of grow our capacity, we really hope hope to tap into these other um, areas and really expand the work that we do. Well, um, I'm very Thank proud you. of the what what's being accomplished. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. Really appreciate that. Um, Cynthia, thank you so much. That was fascinating and really kind of illuminated a lot of stuff that I think is fuzzy in most people's minds. I hope not just me, but that was helpful. So thank you so much. And thank you for being here today. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, okay, Deirdre, if you can please... Oh, I lost you. Um, sorry, you... sorry about my uh, early screenshot. No, that's okay. I'm trying to... to test it out yeah so Deirdre okay yep I can see it now Deirdre is the director of California Water Research brilliant brilliant scientist here she's worked with NGOs fishing tribal and community groups on climate adaptation in the California water sector since 2010 she did some scientific research in nonlinear dynamics and Complex Systems Theory at the Center for Nonlinear Studies and the Santa Fe Institute for Complex Systems. She became concerned about the direction of the country and worked as a regional coordinator for MoveOn.org from 2005 to 2009, doing community organizing and movement building. She has found both backgrounds to be helpful in her work on California water. Thank you so much, Deirdre. And I wanted to say, I titled my talk, The Framework of Power in California Water. And it really struck me, um, there's a brilliant Cambridge uh, psychiatrist, Hisham Zuidin, who synthesized the work of several brilliant women about how power operates in societies. And he was, they were talking about how it operates across, you know, race and gender and ableness and class. And suddenly I made the connection, like it's pervasive in California water and the water agencies determine the frame of reference. Uh, they determine who has knowledge authority, who has moral authority, who's entitled to respect and deference. And it's not the tribes, it's not small communities like Wood, it's not the fishing organizations that I've worked with. I, I'm from Santa Cruz and the salmon fishermen in our town were just, had their livelihoods just destroyed when the uh, salmon fishing industry was shut down. And it's not environmental groups that are advocating for the public trust. And I, I'm gonna, discuss a little more about how really dysfunctional it is. Um, let me just a sec, uh, see if I can 
how do I move forward on this? Okay, so. Yeah, take your time. So this is a little bit about my background. Um, as I said, I did research and, and you read that um, and community organizing. And I found having both backgrounds to be really helpful. Um, and I wanted to go into a little bit about my personal history. So I, I have a background, my family, my great grandfather was a civil engineer in Nevada. And he found out that a lead smelter was poisoning the water for the Shoshone Paiute tribe on the Duck Valley Indian Reservation. And he was calling attention to it. And in 1915, gun sides from the smelter pulled him out of the storm town and shot him in front of my great grandmother and her young daughter. And the fellows were never charged. My grandmother finally got a settlement uh, from the insurance company because he was killed. But I come from a long line of water defenders. Um, also, I'm like, why am I so altruistic? Why am I working on this? But um, I did, uh, I was in Westlands Water District uh, in 2014 during the height of the drought, taking pictures and this huge crop hauling semi pulled out and smacked into my Ford Ranger. And I almost died from abdominal injuries. Um, but I did recover and I have continued working on California water issues. And it's just something that I really care about and I really see the injustices for uh, everybody, for Delta residents, for tribes, um, for all of us, for the fishing communities on the coast that are just having their livelihoods decimated. Um, and for everybody who, who cares about and respects the environment. Um, so let's see, what do I do next? Um, so I've done 12 years of comments on the Delta Tunnel Project. Um, I'm focusing on climate change and um, I did analysis and expert testimony for Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations and Institute of Fisheries Resources on uh, appropriate delta flow criteria, climate change impacts, and modeling, and a failure to adequately consider sea level rise. And uh, for the Sierra Club, Friends of the River, and Planning and Conservation League on history of the water project and over allocation. I also worked with Dr. Tom Williams on the engineering failures. Um, and we had some major victories before the Delta Stewardship Council. Um, the project was found to be inconsistent with best available science on sea level rise based on my testimony in the water fix hearing. And I also supported North Delta Cares Action Plan Committee a testimony on delta, on delta intakes and delta construction impacts on delta legacy communities. And it was a huge David versus Goliath moment because this little grassroots group, uh, the staff draft determination cited uh, Barbara Daly's and my testimony over and over again. And they're finding that uh, the project was inconsistent with Delta's place as well as Sacramento County and um, Michael Brodsky to work with um, the um, Save the California Delta Awards. Um, and I did get the Sally and Les Reed Award from Sierra Club California, and I'm so grateful for your recognition of my work. Um, so the next thing is um, there's a model for true collaboration and joint knowledge production for climate adaptation that the state is just not following in its joint knowledge production and consensus research and participatory design of the climate adaptation measures. And we're just not doing it. People are dragged in and it's like, we have this God awful project and you're supposed to figure out how to make it less evil which is literally a quote from Sean Worth. He was on the, he was the representative for the Sierra Club, the Stakeholder Engagement Committee. And they were asking him, 
you know, which of these places for the, you know, tunnel, uh, in uh, tunnel shafts is less evil <laughs> in terms of its impacts on uh, sandhill cranes. And it's like, it was just the most absurd thing. Everybody was in there and literally it was like, yeah, which of these is less evil? Um, but it's not just um, failure to adequately consider impacts of fish and wildlife and tribes and Delta legacy communities and Stockton, and, um, you know, it's also that they're not even using the best available science. And the state water contractors repeatedly intervened so that the project, the original project didn't consider a drier scenario with more warming for their water yield. And with the single tunnel project, they asked for a single number for yield of the project, which fails to consider uncertainty. And there's a huge issue that this completely fails to consider the observed trends in the 21st century. We all know that there's been a big increase in warming and there's also drying across the Western US. So I'm gonna go a little bit into that. I've been working uh, with Pacific Coast Federation Fishermen's Associations to look at the actual observed trends. Um, this is kind of staggering, but there's been a huge increase in temperatures in the last decade across the Western US. This is with respect to the earliest 30 years of observed temperatures. But in California, across the state, it's been three to four degrees Fahrenheit. And it's just, it's like, wow. And the, I'm working, the state is just the indicators of climate change in California report just hasn't actually adequately captured this alarming increase. And it's global. This sudden increase is part of acceleration in global warming, and we don't really understand why. Um, but it's affecting everything. It's affecting tree mortality. It's affecting drying in the watershed. It's affecting whether we get runoff. Um, it's affecting snow melt. Um, and it's very interesting, but the warming pattern, so both temperature and precipitation in California is related to what happens in the Pacific Ocean. It's a huge impact on the West, Western US. And the problem is the models project that the Eastern Pacific is supposed to warm. And that's associated with more precipitation and more El Ninos. But instead, um, current year accepted, we've been seeing more years with La Nina and this um, cooler pattern in the Eastern US. And um, the problem is that cool pattern may have masked to climate sensitivity to increase greenhouse gas warming. And it's a major area of uncertainty. And that pattern also affects precipitation. Um, they're saying, you know, so this is, there's an international effort to look at these uncertainties um, through uh, the World Meteorological Association. They said the most pressing question is whether climate model simulations will be as far off from observations in the future as they have been relative to recent past conditions. And DWR is just completely failing to consider the mismatch with observations, both about temperature trends and about precipitation. Um, and it's a huge issue. It's a best available science failure because they're not communicating the uncertainty in our knowledge about climate change. Um, this shows the, um, the, the projection of the fifth uh, climate model intercomparison project models, which are used for all of DWS models of climate change, Delta Tunnel, um, sites, everything else. 
and they project this increase in precipitation. We know we haven't been seeing that. It's supposed to have started increasing in uh, the 90s and 2000s. And instead, this is what we've been seeing. It's like, it's actually been getting drier and we're seeing a lot more periods with droughts. And so I did a heat map to download the temp temperature data or the, the precipitation data. And this is the standardized precipitation index, which is better for comparing uh, drier regions in the Southwest, say the Northwest. But there's been a huge increase in the spring months and the lesser one in the fall months. And this is not what the models project. And the Southwest scientists are all over it and they're realizing we have a problem in the Colorado River Basin, but we've got the same warming and drying trends in California. Um, whoops, sorry. Um, but whoops. Uh, I, I, somehow I've got some uh, something here. I'm back. Um, but this is, it's a big decrease from precipitation from the wetter period from 1977 to 98. And so some of the whole basis for this is that the water contractors think that if they, if they just build these huge diversion projects, if they build sites reservoir, if they build the Delta tunnel, that they'll get all this water out of it. And it's because you're using modeling that projects the wetter conditions that we saw from 77 to 98. Oh, we'll be able to restore it. And it's like, yeah, you're not considering the observed trends. You're not considering the risks that these projects will fundamentally fail. And yet at the same time, they are because um, they're, they've been burrowing into the Delta Science Program and they're starting a process to reduce upstream reservoir releases for salinity control in the Delta with climate change. Um, they're proposing to fill in Frank's tract to reduce salinity intrusion um, uh, with, you know, in droughts. But the problem is if you don't have those flows going through the Delta, you know, that it's just gonna be destroyed as an estuary and salmon populations aren't gonna recover. The Delta is going to have worse harmful algal blooms with the have reduced circulation in the Delta. So it's fundamentally an issue that nothing that's being proposed adequately addresses the scope of the problem and the groups that are most impacted by the way we're framing management aren't at the table. They aren't setting the three, well, they're at the table, but under very limited, you can only look at this kind of conditions. And, and the other thing I wanted to say, um, I did submit some of these graphs to the water board as comments on the Delta plan, but the 21st century hydrology, that drying and warming is a profound shift from the 20th century. What we're seeing is just different. We're going to have a lot less runoff in dry years because there's just um, evapotranspiration is like another water user in in drier in drier years, and a lot of the water just never even generates runoff. So anyway, if anybody has any questions or comments. Thank you, Deirdre. Thank you for making this very technical and complicated stuff easier to understand. Um, I think that we we need to find a way for you to share this with DWR, with MWD, with the State Water Board, State Water Commission. All of the big players need to hear your version of things because they're just fed a lot of junk science over and over again. So, yeah, this would be huge. Yeah, I'm working on getting this ready for publication so people can review it. And I've had oh, good. a pretty positive reception from some of the agency folks I've reached out to. They're like, yeah, we knew this was happening, right? Everybody yeah. knows it was happening. It's just 
DWR has been doing these kind of linear models. And if you look at a long-term linear trend, you don't, don't see it. But if you look at the shift in the 21st century, it's really there. And, and it's tied in with these shifts in the Pacific. And the problem is that is just cutting edge science. So those papers came out in the last two, three years, some of them. And they're not incorporating it. I can't even get the um, Belt Independent Science Board to consider. I, I kept saying you need to talk, you need to get a climate dynamicist to pre, to give a presentation. Yeah. Uh, on what's been happening and how much increased uncertainty there is. And they just refused. Instead, they had Brett Milligan from this uh, Just Transition Salinity Management Project come and talk about filling in Frank's tract and how, you know, nobody in the Delta liked it, but they, they got them to participate and work with how to make it less harmful. Um, it's, it's, it's just, it's really hard. So, yeah, a lot of the projections that um, that there are all the agencies are putting out there. Uh, mo most people, most people in the know who have the knowledge of it are aware that there's a lot of misinformation in there. Um, Met has been putting out. They've been working on their integrated regional plan for a long time. It was supposed to be done in 2020, and it seems like they're still working on it. And um, it's all based on their worst case scenario modeling. Their their scenario D which just says that, you know, in the worst case of droughts and everything else, which makes things pretty expensive when you plan for the worst case scenario and when they're trying to get 100% reliability means never ever have to worry about losing a drop. Well, what does that mean for everything else? And um, Met actually requested a long-term projection from DWR as part of their comments on the draft environmental impact report. And then, um, the projections they gave said that um, Matt would receive quite a bit of water by 2070. And I just don't know where they're getting these numbers from. A lot of their member agencies said this just doesn't seem right. So, yeah. Well, it's based on this. And if you look at this is the couple climate model projections. And um, I could really use some um, environmental you know, Delta groups to really understand that just because this says we're getting there by 2070, um, this is the, it's called the multi-model mean. And the DWR is using a slightly different group of climate models and using the median, but it's still like, that they're still looking at this um, projected increase. And we could, so it is projected that at some point we'll flip over to more El Nino-like conditions and we'll see this wetter period. And, but it's like, you know, you're almost, you're saying, oh, well, we need to build these, you know, concrete diversion structures because they'll divert all this water, um, which isn't here right now. It's like, well, your existing diversion structure would work pretty well under, you know, if you assume the drought ends. But um, the other thing is there's a Atlantic deep, Atlantic deep ocean overturning circulation. It's called the meridional or, or, yeah, south, yeah. or south, you know, the equator to pole overturning circulation. And there's evidence that's slowing down. And if it slows down significantly, it's gonna reorganize the atmospheric circulation to a more La Nina-like state in the Pacific. So it's really not certain we'll see that. The models don't capture, it's called the AMOC, the AMOC shutdown either. And so it's just, you know, there's this kind of, there's political interference, like even the Delta, um, I'm sorry, the uh, State Water Project Delivery Reliability Report um, like the state water contractor stepped in and said, oh, we don't want you to consider a change in the pattern of wet and dry years. Just use the 20th century pattern. And it's like, oh, guys, <laughs> you know, no, so nobody will actually have the any actual modeling that shows 
what we all know we're seeing. We're, they're just, the state water project is getting less reliable. Mm -hmm. So it's all structured, even at the deepest technical levels around let's support what, you know, let's, let's provide support for what they want to do. And, and the political interference with the science is why it's just completely maladaptive for climate adaptation. So the AMAC shutdown, that's supposed to happen as early as 2025, right? 2025 through 2050? It's pretty unlikely. I mean, that was the lower end, um, but by mid-century or end of century, there's just a new um, study that came out by Dutch folks that also indicates they thought it wasn't going to happen until after 2100. There wasn't any risk. And recent studies that tell, no, it, we are in the middle of it and we're getting closer. And that's a huge tipping point. It would also be really catastrophic for like uh, agriculture in Europe. Yeah. So. It, it is, um, and I, you know, I try not to sugarcoat it, but, you know, there there is a very real optimism bias in everything Wade Crowfoot is doing and everything the administration is doing. Oh, if we just do floodplain restoration, we'll solve this. Well, you're going to have less. If you look at what's actually happening here, it's like you're not going to have the flows to inundate those floodplains as often and it's not going to be so it's if you're trying to make habitat for salmon it's not going to be inundated as often unless you set some minimum diversions under the floodplain um, it's not going to be as effective in recharging groundwater we've got to change our cropping patterns yeah, groundwater recharge is a problem across the whole country. 90% of U.S. groundwater is depleted. So, yeah, huge problem. Um, Ginny wanted to know if you're okay sharing your slides. I know you said you're working on a report. Um, yeah, I'd like to. Um, I, I somehow I was put fiddling with this, um, and I managed to miss. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. The, yeah. The one, that one slide I wanted. I saw to that. Play. Yeah, take your time with that. So I'll yeah. fix that, and then I'll give it to you. I think I've got um, everything. Oh, and by the way, these are from uh, the NOAA website. Um, the right. other ones are my own graphs. So the, these heat maps I did myself, and I really played around and did a lot of work to try and figure out how to visualize what was happening. Yeah, it's... It it's, really it's, shows the drawing. Fantastic visual. Thank you. Um, Ginny, you have a question? You're still muted, Ginny. Ah, no, I just wanted to tell Deirdre that this is really a revelation. Can you not hear me? We can hear. Yeah, no, okay. thanks. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah, your visualizations are really good. But this is such important. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I do have to tell you the story. So I worked, I knew I needed to get this done in time to submit to the water board on January 19th. And I worked solid over Christmas break and over Martin Luther King holiday. And in fact, I even, I have a repetitive stress injury and I flared up and I had pain shooting down my arm, but I just rested for a bit and kept going. But, but yeah, I just, um, the background and um, I did a lot of um, computer coding so you know I was able to do this and I think it's really good for the NGO and fishing and Delta community to have access to this kind of analysis I've been saying I you know we need to analyze this I've been trying to tell the Delta Independent Science Board we need to analyze this for a year and finally I just gave up like they weren't going to do it. But the next step is to advocate that it be included in the water board processes because the water board hasn't had this. They've rely been relying on DWR to for all their, you know, watershed analysis and DWR hasn't wanted to go there. Yeah. Thank you for that, Deirdre. Are there any other questions for Deirdre? 
Okay. Deirdre, thank you so much for this. This is really revolutionary stuff. And thank you for connecting to how there are certain communities left out of all this disability included. And, you know, they don't make it easy for the public to participate, not only with the timing of all of their appointments and um, meetings and hearings and everything else they do, but uh, it's, it's everything about the systems and public engagement from all these agencies just leaves a lot to be desired. So thank you for highlighting that. And um, everyone, thank you for joining us and thank you for um, thank you for being here today on a Saturday and it's absolutely appreciated. I know I learned a lot and I do this stuff every day. I'm hoping everyone learned a lot. It was powerful and emotional and um, I really loved hearing the testimony from everyone who joined us and thank you for the insightful and engaging conversation in the chats as well. And um, Tom, I'll share your information with everyone. Um, and I hope that can um, conversations continue to come out of this and that we all work together on all of these goals and stay engaged with each other. So um, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to our panelists for joining us and for this brilliant, amazing conversation. This week, I will send out all of the links that we discussed. And once this gets up on our website, I will send that out as well. And thank you everyone for being here on a Saturday. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks so much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.